Oh boy, are we gonna be sitting here for a long time. Hello friends, I'm Rosa, welcome to the channel. So today we are talking about all the 2022 releases that I've both pre-ordered and gotten through book boxes and various things that I just have not read yet and it's a lot. I actually got a little bit embarrassed picking all of these off my shelves, so that's a thing. I will be making sure to leave like timestamps in the description box, so there'll be chapters down here if you'd rather hear about adult fantasy books, for example, you can find them down here on the timeline. But I think if I manage to count correctly, I got about like 52 books that we're talking about today, so I'm gonna try to make it as short as possible, because otherwise we'll be sitting here for like an hour. This video will probably turn out an hour anyway, but I'm gonna do my best, I promise. So, if you wanna check out any of the books, I will try at least to leave links to them in the description box, but there might be too many for that to be possible. I'm gonna do my best though. But we're gonna start out with young adult fantasy, which is also the biggest category, because I have a lot. So the first book that we're talking about is Edgewood by Kristen Ciccarelli or Cicerelli. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but this is like, think, haunted kind of mysterious and very dangerous woods that I believe is inhabited by Faye as well. And our lead girl's grandfather goes missing so she has to enter the woods as like a last resort to find him. And so doing so but has to enter a deal with the elf king. So in exchange for her grandfather's freedom she has to give up her voice and there's a whole thing there. So this is like very folk, lorey, very mysterious woods kind of vibes and I have not read it, so I hope I'm right about the vibes though. Take every synopsis that I do with a grain of salt in this video, okay? <laughs> it's hard to summarize books that you've not read yet, so just, you know. Then I got Princess of Souls by Alexander Cristo, which I believe is a retelling of Rapunzel, um, and you know, the girl in the tower, I don't remember what it's called. But we follow the girl who is stuck in a tower, she's imprisoned there by an evil king. And we also follow a soldier who is out to get revenge on the evil king and his whole court. So his first mission for himself is that he has to go to this tower and kill this girl in the tower, and then stuff happens. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's a retelling of Rapunzel, right? I'm fairly sure, but it's just like, the whole cover doesn't give me Rapunzel vibes. It's a retelling of something at least, so. Then we got another retelling, which is An Arrow to the Moon by Emily XR Pan. I'm fairly sure this is a Romeo and Juliet retelling, actually. So think like two young people that meet and somehow there's infatuation there, but their families are kind of in drama with each other, that sort of situation. I'm fairly sure that's what this is about as well. And then with a fantasy vibe to it as well, but I don't really know what that's about though. Also, unfortunately, this doesn't seem that well received, which is why I haven't really been too eager to get into it, but an arrow to the moon. Then we have The Ones We Burn by Rebecca Mix. This is the fairy loot edition, by the way. If you want to check out the unboxing that I did, it's going to be linked in one of the corners. I still think that this is the worst edition that they've ever made, in newer times at least, within the last couple of years. <laughs> So I just, I stand by that. But I've reversed the dust jacket, which is why it looks like this. So in this book though, we follow a blood witch who has, after being titled like Bloodwin or something by her coven, she has been sent off to the king to, or prince, whatever, to both marry and then kill him. But when she gets there, it turns out that the prince and the princess are not as bad as people are saying that they are. And there's also a plague that is hitting the lands that they live in. And so are the girl needs their help to figure out how to stop this plague and save the witches because the plague is hitting the witches and that is the ones we burn. A lot of controversy surrounding this book so I'm just gonna leave it be for now. <laughs> for now at least. Then we have one that I was actually super excited. I'm still excited to read it. It just has to be the right time. It's Wild as the Witch by Rachel Griffin. In this book we follow a witch who is very set on hiding the fact that she is a witch so she doesn't really do magic. She does it in private but not like you know, she only does it in private. So she works at a wildlife refuge, I think, where she works alongside a guy called Pike and the two don't get along at all. So one night she is kind of like writing up a curse that she can cast on Pike, but then decides not to do it. And unfortunately an owl comes in, picks up the curse and flies off. And she's like, oh no, <laughs> what, what, uh, where did my curse go? And as it turns out, this owl is also an amplifier, which means that if, 
something happens with the curse while it's in possession of the owl, it'll hit a lot more people than just Pike. So our lead girl has to go to Pike and be like, um, listen, I might have messed up a little bit. Can you help me get this curse from this owl? Which now that I say it out loud sounds so weird. <laughs> but that's what this is about. And you can see the owl up here. It's pretty cool. I'm very excited to read this at some point because I loved her first her first book, uh, The Nature of Witches. It was great. So hoping for similar vibes from this one. This one I can't really say much about because I haven't read the first two and I've also not read The Raven Boys, but I got Grey Warren by Maggie Steve Vader, which is the third in the Dreamer trilogy, but it's the spin-off. This trilogy is a spin-off of the Raven Cycle and I've not read that quartet either, so I can't really say much on it. I really want to though because I heard very lovely things about it and there's a whole, I think it's the 10 year anniversary next year or this year, I can't remember, but from what I've heard, it's a very good series. So, but yes, Grey Warren have not read it either. I gotta go through a lot of books before I can get to this one, so I feel like that's understandable. And then we got another one that I'm actually really excited to read. It's This Vicious Grace by Emily Feed or Teed. I suck with names, okay? But in this book we follow our lead girl who has the powers to amplify other people's magic. Unfortunately, she's gone through three weddings followed by three funerals because whenever she tries to amplify one of her partner's magic, they end up dying instead. And so it's very important as well that she manages to do this at some point because her island is actually being overrun by demons. But after it failing a couple of times, or more than a couple of times, there's a priest on the island Island who has convinced people that killing her, our lead girl, will actually solve their problem. So she has to hire a bodyguard because people are trying to kill her left and right. And it turns out that this bodyguard might actually also be carrying some secrets that could unlock this whole... It could solve some problems is what I'm trying to say. And there's lemons included as well for some reason. I don't know what that's about, but yes. <laughs> I forgot what this book is about completely, but We All Fall Down by Rose Jabo. I have not read it. Another kind of current controversial book pick, but controversial according to Goodreads. I don't, anyway, I'm not gonna get into it because <laughs> I don't want to, but I have it, I haven't read it, and it came out this year, so it's in this video. Then we have The Darkening by Sonia Mara, which is about a, well, two people. We have our lead girl who is the daughter of a failed revolutionary, but then we also have our lead guy who is a prince. Their paths are kind of entwined at some point because I forgot which one it is of her parents, but one of them ends up dying to his soldiers actually and he's like his only goal in life is to protect people from this storm that is surrounding the city that they live in but because her parent ends up dying or something like that I'm not entirely sure what what's happening something happens with the soldiers and one of her parents she ends up actually having to infiltrate the army so our prince's army and the two of them end up meeting and stuff happens the synopsis in this is kind of confusing to me I'm not gonna lie it feels like there's something missing from the synopsis oh she has to arm herself with her father's book of dangerous experimental magic exciting words to my ears but I'm still confused about the synopsis so that was the darkening yeah. Another special edition is Together We Burn by Isabelle Ibanez and in this one we follow a flamenco dancer whose father is like a dragon hunter unfortunately. Something happens during one of his like shows or something and so our lead girl finds herself in a bit of a um, a bit of a situation because she has to become a dragon hunter to save her family's legacy. Unfortunately for her the only dragon hunter trainer left on the island is a bit of a douche and doesn't want to help her at all so she um, has to find a way to convince him because she's not gonna take no for an answer and that's what this book is about. Also because if she doesn't end up being a dragon hunter I think maybe there'll be some issues with the dragons. I'm not entirely sure but it's kind of hinted at so anyway. Gorgeous cover. They are stunning. Love them. A lot of fire and dancey vibes. And then we got Forging Silver into Stars by Bridget Kimmerer. This is the first one in a spin-off. I think it's going to be a trilogy and it's a spin-off of A Curse So Dark and Lonely. I think that's what it's called. But Groot is covering up the title so I can't see. And I don't really know what this is about. I bought it because I have that trilogy and I read Defy the Night, loved Bridget Kimmer's writing, but I have not read the first trilogy and I want to get through that before I get to this. <laughs> so it'll probably take a while before I get to it, but I'm excited. And speaking of Defy the Night, did I say Defy the Night? 
Anyway, I have Defend the Dawn also by Bridget Kemmerer. Defy the Night was so good. So, so good. I don't know why I haven't read this one yet. Trust me when I say that I'm super annoyed, but anyway. So I can't tell you what this book is about, but Defy the Night is about two people. So we have two rebels actually that live in a kingdom that is currently being plagued by, well, sickness, illness, a plague of sorts. And the only way to keep the sickness at bay is to somehow consume this flower that is very rare and the rich people are kind of hoarding this flower to themselves and taking way too much of it compared to what they actually have to take. So our two lead people actually steal this flower to help out the poorer people in the kingdom. But then unfortunately something happens to one of them and our lead girl ends up having to infiltrate the castle where the royals live and you know the people in charge to figure out what the heck is going on and what she learns when she happens to when she ends up infiltrating the castle will shock her to her core. <laughs> and it was so good and I'm so angry that I have not read this yet but I will get to it in 2023. <laughs> then we have Blood Cyan by Deborah Fillet, which was another one of those, like going into 2022, I was so excited to get my hands on this book. And then for some reason, I just kept pushing it, pushing reading it off. Like I just haven't gotten to it. <laughs> I don't know, it's so frustrating. There's a lot of those, but this book, I'm gonna read out loud just like the first bit because that's all you need to know. I am a descendant of Shango, the god of heat and fire. I am a living inferno. I am a dead girl walking. So it's essentially about a descendant of this god Shango. So she has a lot of like powerful powers that she keeps hidden. Dangerous things can happen if people learn that she has this, these powers, but in the world that she lives in, they take children in to become child warriors essentially. So they have like a whole child army and when she's 15, she's ridden into the army as well, which causes some issues because how do you hide your powers when you're in the army? <laughs> but also just to add on top of it, she does not like these people that are running the army. In fact, they are pretty much her enemy. And so she decides to try to infiltrate their ranks as well and basically bring them down from the inside. So I think this is supposed to be a series. I'm not sure how many books, but we'll see if the sequel comes out in 2023. And then we have The Ballad of Never After by Stephanie Garber, which is the sequel to Once Upon a Broken Heart. Yes, which I loved. I read this year actually, and then I just didn't get to this one, but I will. So can't say much about this one, but in the first one we follow this. These are also a spin-off of Caravel actually, so the Caravel trilogy. I would recommend that you read those before going into these, just to know the characters a little bit better, but also to not get any spoilers if you're planning on reading that trilogy later on. So in these ones we follow Evangeline Fox and also Jax, who is a fate. So he's kind of like a deity of some kind. Evangeline has been in love with this guy for, not Jax, another guy, for a long time. Unfortunately for her, he is actually getting married to her sister. And that's, of course, leaving Evangeline with a broken heart. So what does she do? She contacts Jax, who is the Prince of Hearts, to enter a deal with him so that she can get this guy. He's like, okay, I'll stop the wedding in exchange for three kisses. And I'm gonna cash in those kisses when I want to, by the way. So like, don't think you're just gonna kiss me. It's up to me when to cash in these kisses. Evangeline says yes because she's desperate, but what she doesn't know is that really you should not trust Jax and things do not go the way that she planned. So also there might be a lot more going on in this world than we thought there was. And that's all I'm gonna say, yes. <laughs> But that world is like, if I could mention one world that I would possibly want to visit, like me as a person, just like for one day or something, I would love to visit that world because the magic is so whimsical in a way and like very festive, very performancey. I don't know, I thought, I think it would be fun. So this was actually one of the first books that I got this year and the sequel is coming out soon and I suck for not reading this, but this Woven Kingdom by Tehera Mafi. In this one, we follow a girl and a guy. So the guy is a prince and he has heard prophecies of his father, his king. Actually, I actually don't know if, it, if it's his father, but of the king dying. The girl is a servant, but she has some secrets because 
because she is actually the long lost heir to the Jin kingdom and might actually be one of the reasons like she might have a hand in this prophecy and so um that's a whole thing but there's also something going on with these two like there's some forbidden love happening here and like a little bit of enemies and you know well she knows that they're enemies he might not <laughs> you know that sort of situation so it sounds like it would be right up my alley I just haven't read it yet and I suck for it but this woven kingdom beautiful edition as well and then we have ballad and dagger by daniel jose oder which is about a bunch of like it's we follow a guy but it's basically it's about his people who have moved from an island to new york centuries ago because this evil over like they took over the island essentially and so he lives in new york and is practicing music he's a bit of a prodigy he really wants to get the attention of this like music legend as well and he gets the chance during a party, a celebration that is happening. Unfortunately, the evil that took over their island has finally come to New York and stuff goes down during this party, this celebration. And because of this, our lead guy finds himself kind of thrust into an ancient battle that is going on between his people and this evil. And he also finds out that he has some powers that he did not, he was not aware that he had them. And that's all I know about Balin and Dagger. I don't know who she is because she's not mentioned in the synopsis, but I want to know. Then we have another spin-off, which is Saint by Adrian Young. So this is like almost like a prequel to Fable, the duology, and it's about Saint from that story and what happened sometime before Fable took place. So it's essentially his story. I don't know much about it. I can't even remember who Saint is at this very moment, but I will figure it out before reading it. I just loved that duology. So when I saw that she was coming out with this one, I pre-ordered it so quickly, <laughs> but that's all I know. I also have The Drowned Woods by Emily Lloyd Jones, which I believe takes place in the same world as The Bone Houses, which I read last year and I loved. So in this one, we follow Mare, who is the last living water diviner which means that she has the power to manipulate water and that is a very sought after power because it's you know she's very powerful she's also very dangerous and there's a prince in this kingdom who has been misusing mayor's powers to kill thousands of people but for the last couple of years mayor has been on the run to basically hide from the prince and then one day mayor's old handler who's also the spy master, actually finds her and makes a proposition. He wants Mare to help him kill the prince. And there's something about a heist as well and a whole crew of people that take off to do this heist and stuff. And I'm also expecting dark fairy tale vibes from this when I read it at some point, which I will because I really enjoyed the bone houses. Then we have A Forgery of Roses by Jessica S. Olsen, which is about our lead girl who has a very interesting power. So she can all alter people's bodies through painting. <laughs> like she can paint a portrait and whatever she paints, your body kind of transforms to fit with the portrait. Yeah. And so this is obviously a very sought after power because people are very vain. <laughs> and to protect her family, she keeps it a secret. However, is actually busted. Like the truth about her powers comes out some way and the governor's wife finds out and decides that she wants our lead girl to help her because her son has died. So she wants wants our lead girl to basically bring him back to life. But when she gets to their house, the governor and his wife's house, she finds out that the boy did not actually die by accident and there's a whole mystery going on. So I think she gets the help from the governor's son, the other son, to figure out what is going on in their family. And there's a little bit of a mystery over this as well. I actually have it as an arc as well, so I don't really got no excuse for that one, do I? No. <laughs> Another mystery is Our Crooked Hearts by Melissa Albert. This is confusing to me. I know that we follow a girl and her mother. So in the now, we follow the, the girl, the daughter, who has experienced something weird one night. A stranger appears out of the blue and there's a whole like string of events happening after this appearance. And she also finds out that there's more to her mother than she first thought. So back in the day, because we follow two timelines, we find out how her mother actually learned that she has magic and like see it bloom and stuff. And so in the now, 
somehow their paths are kind of, I mean, she's the daughter, so their paths are already kind of entwined, but something else is going on as well. And it's a whole mystery to me what's happening, but I'll figure it out once I read it. I also have Hotel Magnifique by Emily J. Taylor, which is about two sisters who are struggling a little bit, so our older sister is not really doing well with like finding jobs, or she doesn't like the jobs that she works, but then Hotel Magnifique comes to town and she instantly jumps on the opportunity to apply for a job at the hotel and ends up actually getting it. So this hotel is like super mysterious in some way. It can travel the world and so it's a very, to them, being stuck in the city that they used to live in and not really getting by very well, it's very obviously a very like lucrative opportunity to be able to see the world but as it turns out, there might actually be very nefarious things going on at this hotel. So our lead girl teams up with the doorman to find a way to free the staff and also her little sister from these things happening at the hotel. Also, I think that's something about the, the owner of the hotel, who's a very evil woman. Kind of gives me Night Circus vibes, but I think it's going to be more fast-paced than Night Circus is. Night Circus is also an adult book, so like, can't really fully compare because they're two different, you know, two different vibes, but kind of reminds me of it a little bit. So I got three more young adult fantasy books left. These three, to my knowledge, have horror vibes to them as well. And so we're going to start out with The, Whis the Whispering Dark by Kelly Andrew. <laughs> Don't know what I was about to say, but anyway. In this book we follow our lead girl who is a deaf girl who has ended up at a school where they teach, as far as I know, teach people, kids, to travel between worlds, like parallel universes or parallel worlds. Anyway, she has some interesting abilities as well and has also, because she is deaf, had issues with people kind of looking down on her, but at the school she finally feels like she has an opportunity to prove herself. Unfortunately for her, there is a guy at the school who just, he's a bit of a pretentious guy, like an upper class kind of person, and he knows that he should stay away from her, but is somehow very drawn to her and also finds her powers very intriguing and interesting. And so something happens at the school. One of the students, as far as I can remember, ends up dead. And the two of them find themselves teaming up to figure out what happened to the student, despite knowing that they should definitely stay away from each other. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to read this in October and then I didn't get my copies until November, so that was a bummer. But it's gonna happen eventually. We also have The Depths by Nicole Lesperenze. In this one, we follow our lead girl who has ended up on this island that is super eerie and she doesn't want to be there, but she has to go because she's actually forced to tag along on her mother's honeymoon. So that kind of sucks and I understand it. Also sounds super awkward. But anyway, there are some weird things going on on this island. Our girl is sleepwalking, for example, and she hears voices when she enters the forest and also finds out that there's actually two sisters who died centuries ago. And so she starts to question if maybe these weird things that are going on, you know, the sleepwalking and the voices in the woods, definitely voices from people that are not there. She starts to wonder if maybe the two dead sisters and all this stuff going on if the two might be connected. And so she sets out to unravel the island's secrets and maybe learns some things that she doesn't want to know. And that's depths. As far as I know, this is technically categorized as horror, so just put that out there. And then lastly, we have, which is technically not a horror, but I'm gonna put it under, because it has like dark vibes, like dark fairy tale vibes. Cursed by Marissa Mayer, which is the sequel to Gilded. I have read the first one, but I've not read this one yet. I'm not in a hurry to, but I wanted to pre-order it just because I still want to read it. I didn't love Gilded, but I'm willing to give this one a chance in the hopes that maybe it's sped up a little bit compared to Gilded, but in Gilded, at least, we follow our lead girl who is a masterful storyteller. Like, she can end up in stupid situations but just talk her way out of it by telling stories. She's known in her town as like this amazing storyteller. She does, however, one night end up in a bit of a situation. To get out of the situation, she ends up coming up with a story about her being able to spin gold out of hay or something like that. Unfortunately for her, the Earl King, so he's the king of the undead, hears of this story and of course wants a piece of that. So he ends up basically taking her to this castle where she lives with all kinds of dead people so that she can spin gold for him. 
And so our lead girl finds herself trapped in the castle with no one there except this one guy who's very strange and like, where did he come from? And who happens to actually be able to spin gold out of the hay or whatever it is. I can't remember what material it is. And so the two of them team up and there's a whole situation there. Some questions about her mother as well. And because her mother is, has passed or she, she's gone, something. And a lot of weird things going on at this castle. So entering something that's a little bit like new adult. We have The Inadequate Heir by Danielle L. Jensen, which is the third one in the Bridge Kingdom series. I suppose it is now, not a duology. And I... Th this follows two different characters. I don't fully know what it's about. I actually don't want to know. I just want to jump into it. But I do know that we follow Lara from the first duology. I know that we follow her brother and then a girl from another kingdom in this world that it takes place in. So I can't really say... Like, because the story doesn't really have anything to do, as far as I know at least, it's kind of like the first two books are kind of wrapped up, the characters are different, so it doesn't really have anything to do with that, <laughs> the whole situation in that duology, at least as far as I know. But think like Kingdom that has a lot of issues going on. Drama between different world or countries, drama between different countries and characters that are just kind of like caught up in the middle. I think they like each other too, so like... They got that going for them, I suppose. And then we have Kingdom of the Feared by Cara Maniscalco, which is the third one in the Kingdom of the Wicked trilogy, in which we follow Emilia, who is a witch, and she has a twin sister whose name is Victoria, who is also a witch, and they used to be very close to each other. But some strange things are happening with Victoria lately, and she's not confiding in Emilia, whatever's going on. And then one day, Emilia finds her sister dead. So Emilia is hellbend on figuring out what the heck happened to her sister and ends up summoning one of the seven deadly, like the seven princes of hell, specifically Wrath, and kind of tricks him into a bit of an agreement or like making a deal with her because it's not really an agreement. So he has to help her figure out what happened with Vittoria and very reluctantly because he really doesn't want to help her but ends up doing it anyway. So it's a bit like, I don't want to call them enemies per se but they definitely don't like each other. Like reluctant partners to lovers, sort of. And Princes of Hell. But that's the first book. Can't tell you what happens in the sequel. And this is the third one. So I have no idea. Oh, I should probably have said but I think this actually came out as an audiobook in 2021. But this book, the book, came out this year, so. Oh my gosh, I did not know that there'd be a whole drawing of Hog. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm fine. I just opened the picture and was a little bit shocked for a second, but anyway, we're good, we're fine. But yeah, now that that's out in the open, I have not read the fourth book in From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Still not. I am planning on pre-ordering the fifth one even if I have not gone through this one because I'm sure that I'll love it. I'm just nervous going into it. And anyway, we follow Poppy in this book, or in the first one, and Poppy is the maiden. So being the maiden comes with a lot of responsibilities, but also a lot of limits to what you can do with your free time. So she's essentially not allowed to talk to people, make friends, experience any kind of pleasure whatsoever. She's just kind of like, her role is basically just walking around with a veil on and behaving, which Poppy is not good at, by the way, might I just add. <laughs> so at night, Poppy has a tendency to to sneak out of the castle that she lives in because she doesn't really want to, I think she hasn't realized it yet at that point, but she doesn't actually want to be the maiden. One night while she's out and about, as she usually does, she ends up at a bar where she bumps into Hawk. Some stuff goes down and Poppy really starts to question if this maiden role is for her. There is also an infiltration of the castle by Hawk who ends up being her bodyguard. So <laughs> there's a bit of a situation and a whole lot more going on than what you would think at first. But first and foremost, fantasy romance. And I think for fantasy romance, the first two books at least were so good. I'm just nervous going into the fourth one, so I haven't yet but we'll see what it happens. Speaking of fantasy romance, we're now entering adult fantasy. I have the undertaking of Banner and... No, why did I say Banner? <laughs> Heart and Mercy by Megan Banner. <laughs> there we go. This is like slightly confusing to summarize, I think, but 
we follow two people who one is an undertaker which i don't really know what it is which is probably why it's confusing to me and the other one is a marshal who patrols the woods and i imagine that they also he he is that is that a he he might he might be a he uh, finds bodies now and then and stuff like that you know and the two don't get along they have to work together but they don't get along until one of them ends up receiving a letter from some mysterious person and there's a whole pen pal shift going on all of a sudden and you know so i have heard lovely things about this and i'm saving it for a rainy day i just need to get to a day where i feel bad about everything <laughs> you know you know those days yes and i haven't read books like good books for a while and i just need something funny and light and cute that's what i'm gonna go into that one hopefully it'll do it for me so we'll see otherwise put my eggs in the wrong basket and that's on me. Then we have Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry which is about an orc who is tired of killing and wants to settle down and do chill stuff so she, they, I don't know, chooses to open a coffee shop in a very busy and very crime-written city which is a difficult task considering our dear orc also has a lot of enemies so she also decides to get some help with the coffee shop. But those enemies might come knocking on the door one day, if you know what I mean. Cozy fantasy as far as I've gathered, and everyone loves it, so I'm expecting to love it too, but saving it for a rainy day. <laughs> then we have one that I've completely forgotten that, um, I've completely forgotten what it's about, because that happens sometimes. It's The Final Strife by Sarah El Arifi, and, um, I'm gonna read out the back because we'll experience together what this actually is about. I love the cover for this though. And like the little foil details here, love it. The empire rules by blood. Red is the blood of the elite of magic of control. They are the embers. Blue is the blood of the poor of workers of the resistance. They are the dusters. Clear is the blood of the servants of the crushed of the invisible. They are the ghostings. Is that rule about to come to an end? Question mark. I'm guessing yes. I don't know. Also, love the end papers. Gorgeous. If this is not a vibe, then I don't know. I bought this, pre-ordered it on a whim, which is why I can't really remember what it's about. But i um, excited to go into it at some point. I just keep forgetting that I have it as well. It's kind of a thing because I bought it so quickly. <laughs> I was just kind of like, all right, I have that. Yeah. <laughs> then we have Her Majesty's Royal Coven by Juno Dawson. I think the sequel is actually coming out soon-ish. Ah, uh, no, it's coming out in June. We got a little while left to read this. But in this book, we follow a coven of witches who have split up for various reasons. So one still works in HMRC, Her Majesty's Royal Coven, but the others have kind of like, you know, scattered about doing their own things until one day the coven actually ends up in trouble and so our girl who is still in the coven goes out to her old friends to get their help. Something about prophecies and there's like a person who is threatening to reveal the secrets of the witches in the world. We're not supposed to know that they exist and stuff and I don't know what else this is about actually. <laughs> but that's what I've gathered. Ooh, and then we have The Oleander Sword by Tasha story which is the sequel to the jasmine throne which i loved such a good book lovely yes i have not read this yet it's a thing but in the first book we follow a priestess and a princess so the princess has ended up at a temple which is filled with priestesses she's basically there as a prisoner and she doesn't want to be there she hates her brother the prince who has locked her up in this temple but she's trying to just survive but as for our priestess she is carrying some secrets and and one day something happens at this temple that, like with the priestess, that the princess overhears. She kind of sees some things that she's not supposed to see and finds an opportunity to both get closer to the priestess but also possibly get some help from the priestess in the future. And so she ends up getting her specifically to be her maid so that they can get closer and yeah, no. Something about bringing down the patriarchy. <laughs> yes. But also just um, ending the, the prince's rule because he sucks. Like, I hate that. I hate that dude. I hate him so much. <laughs> Think like burning women and such. Like, no. Big no-no. I also got Electra by Jennifer Saint, which I'll admit I'm confused what's about. Except that we follow Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra, Cassandra and Electra. So three women in Greek mythology that might have been a little bit forgotten by some people and it's like a retelling of their stories. I'm expecting feminist vibes from this. So a little bit in the same vein, but also Greek mythology vibes, obviously, but 
yeah. And then I wanted to put this at the end of the category because I feel like this is very heavily historical fiction with like a sprinkle of fantasy to it. That is Babel by Arif Kwong, which I've still not finished. I was supposed to read it this month and then I ended up swapping it out with another book because... I don't do historical fiction very well, as I've said many times on the channel. And I thought this was going to be a lot more fantasy than it ended up being. And now I'm just kind of struggling through it. I know that a lot of people are loving this, but I also know that a lot of people are in the same boat as me. But in this book, we follow Robin who has been brought, he's half Chinese and half English, and he's been brought from China to England to essentially just, well, he's supposed to like study at Oxford and Babel. So study languages because the British Empire makes silver bars. And that's like the fantasy type to this these silver bars carry magic in one way and it's connected to language so they need someone like Robin to make more silver bars and Robin is there with a little crew of friends they're four students total and they're hanging out together and there might be some stuff happening with this little group of friends and you know and Robin also when he learns like when he finds out starts to see what actually is going on from the inside of Babel I mean he learns that he doesn't actually like what he sees and also starts to question why the British Empire holds so much power and why they don't share a little bit of it with you know poorer countries and such and so um some questions are asked such as how how do we bring this down can we bring it down can we stop them you know that sort of thing very heavily historical fiction which is why I'm just kind of <laughs> struggling a little bit with it we have another one that's also like at least this the first one was Dark Academia Vibes, which is The Atlas Paradox. This is also the last adult fantasy book that I have to show. And I put it here because it does have like slight sci-fi vibes to it now and then. At least the first one did. But I want to call it like urban sci-fi. I don't know exactly. <laughs> Doesn't it? I feel like it does. It's just a vibe, okay? But any anyway, in the first one, we follow six students who are Medeans. So they have Medeans in this world, in this version of our world, have magic. And these six students, except for two of them, have different kinds of magic. So they have been selected out of all the Medeans in the world as six of the most powerful ones to be brought to Alexandria, the library of Alexandria, where they have to study study and also do various things to protect the library from outcomers or like enemies and such and they're only supposed to be there for a while like during a trial sort of situation what they're not told though is that one of them isn't just declined from actually working there or staying there but also has to die so what happens when these six people these very egotistical very selfish people <laughs> learn that one of them have to die i wonder i thought for a second i was sitting with the atlas six that would have been so awkward but anyway i have not read this yet i will didn't love the atlas six but but the ending had me really intrigued, so um, we'll see. And then we got a sequel to a book that I've not read and I can't remember what it's about, but I pre-ordered Seven Mercies by Elizabeth May and Laura Lamb earlier this year and I got it. I've not read the first one. <laughs> I can't remember what it's about at all, but young adult sci-fi. Um, and that's really all I can say. I think there's something with a squad. And also it says feminist space opera. It's a lot like Star Wars, but far more murdery. I feel like there's a lot of murder going on in Star Wars, so it's kind of impressive but um yeah and I have not read Nona the Ninth yet but loved the first two books definitely not everyone's cup of tea but I really enjoyed them I thought they were very interesting so a little bit nervous going into this one but it will definitely happen at some point so the only thing I can't really talk about the sequel the problem with these are that they're so different from each other so me talking about the first one does not really do anything to like I can't it doesn't give you an idea idea of what this series is like. But in the first one we follow Gideon who is a uh, very good with a sword, specifically a two-hander. <laughs> Gideon is also a woman by the way, or a girl. I'm saying that because some people thought going into it that it was a dude, but no no no. Gideon is a girl and she hates being on the ninth planet, so the ninth house. She does not want to be there. She has been there her entire life. She's an orphan. It sucks to be there. Everyone mistreats her. She just wants to not, she wants to get off ninth house. So that's what she's been trying to do many, many, many times. However, has always been uh, stopped in the process of trying to run off. And then one day, Harrow, the ninth, 
who is the reverend daughter, so she is the daughter of the two leaders of the Ninth House, gets a letter from the Forever King because he needs more lictors. Lictors are like master, like supreme necromancers, so they are, think like necromancers on steroids, <laughs> you know? Like they're like crazy necromancers, yes. But you can't just, you're not born a lictor, you have to go through several trials to become one, and he needs more lictors, so he sends off a couple from each planet, to the first house. I think it's the first house. <laughs> oh, it doesn't even say in this one. Never mind. But at the first house on the first planet, these couples are supposed to go through these different trials. So when I say a couple, I mean a necromancer and a cavalier who is basically like their bodyguard, a soldier. As it happens, Harold's situation is that her cavalier sucks, so she decides to make a proposal to Gideon in return for coming with her to the first house, being her bodyguard for a little while. She will let Gideon leave the ninth house. So Gideon can't turn this down, of course, and decides to go with her, and that's what it's about. But those are like the first like the first 30 pages. All I'll say about Gideon is that you really need to give it a chance. Like I was so close to putting it down many, many, many times. But once I got to the page 194, I read the last of it in like two settings because it was so good. It was so fast paced and was, there was a lot going on. It's written in a very funny way. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but moving on. Also, people are firing off fireworks right now. If you can hear it, please ignore it. I'm trying to. <laughs> so last one of my sci-fi, I had like three. Anyway, is Poster Girl by Veronica Roth. This is about a woman who has been the poster girl for like the old regime. So the people that used to run the world, but they were called the delegation by the way. And the delegation one day was overthrown by another movement, whatever. And our lead girl ended up in prison because of it. So forward 10 years, our girl is still in prison, but she is contacted by some of the new leaders because a girl has been missing. She was taken from her parents and they need help to find her again because she was taken by the delegation, so the old regime. And who better to help them with this than the old poster girl? So in the process of finding the girl, she learns a lot of things about both her family because I think her family used to be like higher standing in the delegation and a lot of questions are being raised as well in the process and yes, at least to my knowledge, but we'll see. I heard that this is slightly confusing, but also surprisingly good, so I'm excited, but also a little bit nervous, but maybe like dystopia sci-fi just is supposed to be a little bit confusing. That's my theory anyway, as someone who doesn't read a lot of it, so yes. <laughs> then I got three Horus, which is the first one at least, is One Dark Window by Rachel Gillig. In this book, we follow our lead girl who is dealing like she has a nightmare a i want to call it a demon but i don't I'm, let's just call it a nightmare inside her head like she is possessed by a nightmare a shadow of some kind she lives in a town that is currently being infected by dark magic and one day a guy comes to town the two of them decide to do something about this dark magic infesting the town and there might also be a little bit of an attraction between the two, but our lead girl also knows that she has to hurry and also confront some things because as it turns out, this nightmare might actually like the shadow nightmare thing might actually slowly be taking over her mind. If you want to see him, by the way, he's right there, which is why I call him a shadow, <laughs> but heard many lovely things about this. Surprisingly, like people are really raving over it, so we'll see when I read it. Then we have House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson, which is about a girl who goes to this place, House of Hunger, to become a bloodsmaid. But as she arrives, she finds out that a lot of her fellow bloodsmaids are actually going missing and that she's really gonna have to learn the new rules and how to follow them because otherwise she might be next. And there is also something about a lady, like a leader of the house or like, you know, who's also very intriguing and eye-catching and stuff. <laughs> Don't know the story there, obviously, I've not read it, but Horror vibes with vampires, just in case you could not tell. So um, I'll be reading that at some point for sure. And lastly, of my horror books, we have The Book Eaters by Sonia Dean, which is about a mother and her son. So they are a part of like a group that are called The Book Eaters. And The Book Eaters eat books and stories or substance. Substance? Not substance. Substance. I definitely just skipped over a syllable. 
My apologies, moving on. <laughs> Unfortunately, her son has been born with an affliction because he's not a book eater, he's a mind eater. And mind eaters don't eat books, they eat... Um, you know, the thing inside your skull. They eat brains. Yes. So to avoid something happening to her son, because mind eaters are not supposed to be in the book eaters community, she runs off with him, both to keep him safe, but also to find a cure for this affliction. Such an interesting concept. Like, book eaters. I mean, same. I'd probably be in that community, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> with the amount that I read every month, yes. Did I just say did I just say read or eat? I said read, right? I'm moving on, okay. So I have one kind of leaning on literary fiction, <laughs> which that in itself that I only have, well, I mean, this is like the only, I have maybe three books that lean on literary fiction in my collection. I've read neither of them. <laughs> But Portrait of a Thief by Grace D. Lee was an Illumicrate pick earlier this year and if the box hadn't come with some items that I really wanted, I would have skipped it because I just don't read this kind of like work. I don't do that. I have no interest in reading this whatsoever, I just have it. <laughs> and I've come to that conclusion months ago and it's fine. I'm okay with it. So as far as I can remember, this book is about a very like a student. He's an art history major and he's like the perfect student. His parents love him, you know, that sort of thing. But then an organization contact him because they need help with something very, very illegal. They need him and a group of other people to steal back some Chinese sculptures that was taken from China years and years and years ago. And so there's a heist. But I think this book is actually not so much about the heist itself, which is a shame, unless you like the kind of like, I don't know. I think if it had been about the heist, I would have been on board with it. But as far as I've gathered from several reviews, it's not really about that. So just doesn't sound like my cup of tea. Yeah. Then I got one mystery book, which technically could probably fall under rom-com too, but Finlay Donovan Knocks Him Dead by El Cosimano. I read Finlay Donovan is Killing It in October or November. Loved it to bits, so I ordered this right away. In Finlay Donovan is Killing It, we follow Finlay, who is a crime novel writer and also a single mom, and she has like no free time whatsoever. She is struggling big time, both because she doesn't really have a lot of money, but also Life is just very hectic as a writer and also a single mom. So everything is just kind of falling apart in front of her, pretty much. Like she can't keep up. And then one day she goes to a meeting with her agent where they discuss her latest novel and the plot of it. So she's basically describing a murder out loud at this cafe and a woman at the table next to her and her agent overhears this and instantly jumps to the conclusion that Finlay is a hit woman. And as it turns out, she really wants her husband gone. So she hires Finlay, without Finlay really being on board at first, to kill her husband. But when Finlay finds out that there might be money involved, you know, she's kind of like starting to question, should I, should I do this? And you know, one thing leads to another. It's funny. The first one is so funny. So I'm looking forward to that one, but saving it for a rainy day. So I got one young adult contemporary, which is I Kissed Shara Wheeler by Casey McQuiston. I don't really do young adult contemporary romances, but really, really loved Red White and royal blue, so I'm giving this a chance. In this book, though, we follow Chloe, who is a perfect student, a perfect daughter. She has gone to high school with just one goal in mind. She wants to become valedictorian, and the only person in her way is Shara Wheeler. And then something weird happens because Shara Wheeler kisses Chloe and then disappears. Just, she's just poof, gone. And Chloe is left confused understandably so. Also because it turns out that she's not the only one Shara has kissed out of the blue and then just disappeared. She's kissed three other people. I think one of them is actually Chloe's friend and then there's other two other people as well. And so the three of them, four, the four of them team up to figure out what happened to Chloe. And Shara finds out that she actually really, sh like she's, you know, kind of, kind of interested in Chloe as well. I mean, I get it. You've been rivals for a long time and you never know, like rivalry very much leans on heavily crushing. I get it. <laughs> There's definitely something like like an overlap there. So kind of uncool that she also goes ahead and kisses three three guys, but we'll figure out what happens. And as for my adult contemporary romances, I have quite a lot, so apologies. 
but starting out with Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. In this book we follow these two girls. One is a photographer who has moved to New York, is living life to her fullest and just enjoying everything about it. And the other one is a very busy single mother. So our photographer, Delilah, her stepsister is getting married and she kind of tricks or at least talks Delilah into being the photographer for the wedding. And as she's helping with preparations and everything, she finds out that Claire, who's possibly like they might have some history, I think, is also attending the wedding and she's also a part of the preparations and stuff. The two of them start to spend a lot of time together and there's a pole. Yes. I love this uh, this illustration, by the way. I think it's so cool. <laughs> I really love it. So that is another one that I heard many good things about. So I'll be looking forward to reading that eventually. I also have Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. And this book is about two arc enemies who end up in the same program with an, at NASA. The same program at NASA. Is it NASA? NASA? I don't actually know how to pronounce that. <laughs> I'm gonna go with NASA. Yes. But we follow our lead girl and she finds this guy like incredibly infuriating but also kind of, you know, like he has something going on for him as well. He has made himself clear though that we're not gonna happen. But as they spend more time together, he's slowly moving from being an arc enemy to a little bit of an ally to her. So I really loved um, the love hypothesis. So I have faith that I'm gonna love that one as well, but I'm saving it for a rainy day. <laughs> In reality, most of these I'm probably either not reading because I'm nervous, because I didn't fully love the first one, or because I'm saving them for a rainy day. Yeah. We're almost at the end. I got six more to go. The American Roommate Experiment by Elena Armas. Loved the Spanish love deception, so I'm nervous going into this. But in this one, we follow our lead girl who has just quit her job to follow her true passion, which is to be a romance writer. However, she's already, like, she's hit a wall. She has ended up in a creative slump. And to make it even worse, something happens. The ceiling in her New York apartment falls down, it crumbles or falls in and she has to move somewhere else. So her friend or something like that has promised her that she could stay at her apartment while the ceiling is getting fixed. Unfortunately, as she gets there to the apartment, it turns out that her friend's cousin has also been promised that he could stay there. And this is awkward because it's a very small studio apartment. And also, our lead girl has been stalking the cousin on Instagram for a while, but the two of them end up staying at the apartment together. Lucas, the guy, is fine with it, and then he learns about our lead girl's creative slump and proposes that they do some creative research for, you know, romance novels so she can get past this slump. One thing leads to another, you know where we're going with this. Forest proximity, I love, so <laughs> yes. Then I got Tessa Bailey's Hook, Line, and Sinker. The thing about this one is that we follow two characters from It Happened One Summer. Yeah. And that is our lead girl, Piper, I think her name was, from It Happened One Summer's, um, her sister. But also Fox, who is a bit of a ladies' man, an if-boy. <laughs> I don't know. Well, he's nice. So like, can you be an F-boy and still be nice? Like, I don't know how that works. As you can tell, I'm not in contact with people very often. <laughs> I think in that situation, it's actually good. Okay, I'm getting off track. But without like, without having read It Happened One Summer, it's a little bit difficult to explain the, the chemistry between these two characters. Just know that Fox is, isn't that his name? Fox. Yeah. Fox is very much crushing on Hannah and Hannah is just like, we're just friends. You know, so like the one time he actually feels like, you know, the girl is just not interested, but we'll see what happens. They're really good friends and it happened one summer though, so I think I like that sort of chemistry because I did like them and it happened one summer. I also have Book Lovers by Emily Henry. I want to read this after I read People We Meet on Vacation though, just to clarify. <laughs> but in this one we follow two work nemeses who... nemesises? I don't know. Anyway, who somehow end up in the same town and keep bumping into each other. One is a literary agent and the other one is an editor, so like they both work in the same business business and I don't know one thing something happens there's a plot twist that they did not foresee so I also have King of Wrath by Anna Huang which is about two characters one is the CEO of like a huge company and he's old money yeah, very rich. He lands himself in a situation where he is being blackmailed and so to get out of the situation he has to marry the girl in this book as well. So our girl is like, she's a jewelry heiress and her family's like new money but 
going into this marriage can open a lot of doors for them. So she says yes. What the two of them didn't predict though is that they would end up actually also liking each other despite this marriage of convenience. I don't really know if this is a mafia romance but I'll find out when I start reading it I suppose. It's just that I'm generally not very good with mafia romances but I'll find out. <laughs> I also have Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez which or Jimenez which is about two characters. So one is an ER doctor living in the big city. Although her family is not like because both her parents are like surgeons. They're not very happy with her just just being an ER doctor but anyway she's living life. She's happy with it. One day though due to a bet she ends up meeting this guy who is from a small town and while spending time with him outside of the city she starts to question if maybe she's truly happy with where she is in life because she actually also likes the guy and she likes the vibe out there and stuff. So I heard many lovely things about this. Oh whoops I dropped my book. But I'm super excited to read this at some point. Saving it for a rainy day, you know the deal. And lastly we have a sequel to a book that I've not read. <laughs> but it's Terms and Conditions by Lauren Asher. I think this has, yeah, marriage of convenience because he's supposed to inherit a company or something like that. So it's like, I don't know, I have some weaknesses when it comes to <laughs> romance books. Forced proximity, enemies to lovers, although he can't really do that one in contemporary as well as in fantasy. Because I don't know, putting knives to people's throats kind of looked down upon in our world, but kind of okay in fantasy worlds. So you know, but at least Arch Enemies. Rivals is also a fan. And of course, Marriage of Convenience or like, you know, that sort of thing. I love it, especially combined with Forced Proximity. Just love it. So I think both this one, but also the fine print will be um, good for me, but I don't actually fully know what the story is. I just know the tropes. <laughs> and those were my 2022 releases that I've not read yet. We'll do another one of these in 2023 because I buy a lot of books and don't read them. So anyway, I'm gonna finish off this video now because it's already way too long. I hope you enjoyed it. I will try to link all the books in the description box of the video by the way. So if you want to check any of them out, hopefully you can. But if you've read any of the books and you want to share your thoughts, please do so in the comment section down below. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to hit the thumbs up and if you want to see more videos like this from me, but also videos like readathons and wrap-ups and TBR videos, bookish unboxings, and all the other booktube stuff, definitely consider hitting the subscribe button. I'm gonna leave you now. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye. Oh, you know,